everyone, welcome back to episode, I think it's five of B2T, and we don't have any special guests, so it's just our lovely smiling faces. Um, I have a different mug today. This is uh, the office mug, because Daniel and Jane Marie on the last episode were waxing eloquent about the office. Um, so this is a particularly unhinged Michael Scott escapade. Um, so if you haven't seen the office, it's probably something you should see if you work in an office. Um, and yeah, let's. Oh, Melanie, you got a mug as well. It looks like. Yes, I had moved away from my mug, but yes, uh, this was a gift from a colleague uh, because somebody took my mug one day, and she was like, "Well, if we put your name on it, no one will take your mug." There you go. That's a good. That's a good gift. Okay. <laughs> So let's jump into our topics. So the first topic that I would like to talk about is this is a very technical marketing topic, but I think it's a valuable thing to talk about, which is what is the most important information that you can gather on an intake form? So if somebody shows up to your website, they're interested in buying your product, they want to talk more about it, they have questions and they request a demo or something. What should you capture first and foremost? Should it be an email, a phone number, et cetera, et cetera? When, you, when you're designing an intake form, right, I think part of what your question is getting at is um, you want the form to be brief enough that people are going to fill it out, um, but long enough that you get enough information to follow up in an effective way. And But, but what I prefer to do with my intake forms is I'll make the email address required. Um, and then I'll make the phone number optional. And that's just because it seems that the trend is most people want to have their first contact by email. But if they're one of the rare that do prefer phone, it's very good to have that phone number on hand. Yeah, I think from a consumer perspective, if you are going through and you're filling out an intake form, then chances are you're not going to worry. You know, email open rates are much lower than text message open rates, for instance. Um, but if you're going through and you're basically um, putting in all that effort to have it in, uh, fill out that form, like it doesn't matter at that point, the email open rate, you're going to open that email. Um, and I think that's just like a less obtrusive way to go about it. Um, I think it's kind of obnoxious. Like if I would personally go and fill out an intake form and they make me put in my phone number, I'm like, I really hope they don't call me. Um, because I don't want to answer that call. Now, there might be a generational gap here. And also, if they text me, that's also kind of fine. Um, email or text to me is like, OK, sure. Um, the good news about an email is like you can get more information out. Um, so I am kind of with you, Melanie. Like, I think like making the email required and um, providing an option for the phone, if they that's what they want, like, sure. But the email seems to be like the general way to go. Yeah, and I think that you really hit on an important point, Sam, that if someone is already filling out an interest form, that means that they have a compelling interest in the product. Like you don't just fill out an interest form unless you are serious about it. So on the one hand, you don't want the interest form to be so long that people don't fill it out. But the fact that they're choosing to fill out anything at all kind of means that they, they're serious about it. They want to, you know, have a conversation. They want to start something. So I, I think that um, interest forms should not be more than one page. Like if I have to go through multiple pages, then that's when I start to get annoyed. But if it's like a form that says like, hey, you know, how many people are in your company? What's this? Like, I wouldn't mind filling that out because I already have a pre-existing interest in the product. The other thing about a phone number is that you don't know, you might not know whether they prefer you to text them or to call them, whereas with an email address, it's a little bit less ambiguous and you can clarify in your email how they want to be contacted. Now, you could, for instance, like have a little check, like text call right in your form, which I think would be cool. We don't pers we don't have that in our intake form right now, but as we're talking about this, I can't help but think, should we should we do that? <laughs> no, considering like our main product is like unobtrusive business texting, that might not be the worst idea. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it'd be cool, honestly, if you just had like a yeah, check this if you want to be texted. Otherwise, we'll email you. Because you you have to have it be the default has to be email, right? But 
if they want to go through that extra, like, absolutely. Good love. Now, I don't know if we, yeah, something to consider, Melanie. I would be more cautious of putting my phone number down only because, you know, on the daily basis, I get like a million spam calls and texts. So I'm already more or less inclined to pick up a phone. Um, but sending a text message or through like an email, um, I'm more like, you know, it's not like an urgency for me to respond. It's something that, you know, pops up whenever I check, check it. Um, and I do believe like, I agree with everyone, like having an email is like a solid base form of like contact, including like a name <laughs> to, and <Right>. you know, <laughs> Yeah, this is in the context of lead generation, right? Like making new contact with customers. Because I will say that if I'm a pre-existing customer, I do not want them to email me. I want to be on the phone with someone who I can talk to. Yeah, you just made a very important point, which is I think people prefer to be contacted for, you know, like as a cus like as a prospect. I think they prefer to be contacted by email. Um, and I think as but for customer service, like you almost always want to be on the phone with someone, or at least most people I talk to. Now, again, personally, I would prefer to simply like interact with an AI bot. Um, as long as the AI bot is effective, like obviously like Amazon, fantastic at this. Chipotle, very, very good for a while, less so lately, but like these are like, I would prefer to have my problem solved without ever having to like leave this like bot that I'm talking to. But in lieu of that, then yeah, talking to an actual person usually has the best results. You know, I just feel like we should mention the cool project that we have where our chatbot um, automatically collects some information to, to schedule demos for people. So uh, it sounds like uh, we'd be meeting the, the desire of, of, of a Sam prospect. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's a classic target demographic, me. Yeah, the amount of effort that our AI team has been putting into that is insane. Um, and the amount, you know, that that bot could also tell you the weather. You like, they just decided to randomly add that feature. They were like, oh, yeah, what's I, I, I've been doing that. I'm like, what is it like in Telugu right now? And it'll tell you. So now this is kind of like a very conceptual question. Um, and we're still on the intake form, by the way. So, a conceptual question is just like, what? would be the most value from a, I'm gathering the information perspective, right? So I am not the prospect, I'm on the other side of it, and I'm talking to prospects. What's sort of the number one thing that you want to know that's not like contact information? So some samples here might be like company size or like um, opportunity size or location or something like that. We specifically are um, interested in the region that the customer is from because if we can collect the region from them then we know which sales representative to uh assign the case to and we can kind of skip a step of establishing that it is optional on the form uh because almost all of these things you know we don't want to <laughs> bog bog down somebody but um the region is important and then uh opportunity size is important because there is a lower threshold for our service and it also just sort of helps with um, our lead tracking to know from the start um, how much the, the, the customer may have thought that they wanted so that we can kind of track whether sales was able to upsell or and get more, uh, a right. bigger opportunity uh, or, or a lesser opportunity as, as the customer moves through the pipeline. Um, and the the last thing that I try to make sure to collect is um, what product offering you know that they're interested in because we sell a few different product offerings and so just having that information um, before the call is even scheduled can help help our sales representatives have uh, collateral ready for the call. Okay, let's move on to the second topic, um, and this is prescient because Melanie is wearing some branded apparel right now, and we love branded apparel at this company. However, there are other companies um, that have dress codes. And I think this is a lot more prevalent in the past and has been changing, which is why I think it's an interesting question. Um, so what do we think about dress codes in general? 
um, and especially specifically for office. Like obviously there's other, you know, areas of life, like some schools have dress codes and things like that. And that makes a lot of sense. Um, but what do we think about a one, the concept of a dress code and then two, what should be the dress code? Like there's plenty of options here. Should it be business formal? Should it be business casual? Should it be branded apparel all the time? What do we think? I specifically am in a field where it's usually optional, right? Uh, or, or at least to an extent, it could be optional because I'm not customer facing. You know, uh, when it comes to like making, you know, business casual or logo wear, uh, that's usually because you're you're the face of the company for some reason. I mean, that, that that's a, a huge part. Now, when it comes to sort of um, old school professions that make everybody kind of dress up uh, in, 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 in professional wear uh, for like status and respect reasons. It's not my scene, I gotta say, you know? Um, so I, I, I appreciate the freedom of not doing that, but I also understand like why some people uh, appreciate that. You know, I've heard people say like, oh, you know, when I get into my, you know, business casual wear, it like puts me in the mindset, you know, uh, to work. And, um, you know, so some people might appreciate that culture. Uh, but, you know, I I think that it's it's definitely critical that if you're going to have a professional dress code, um, that you're not discriminatory about it because, you um, you know, uh, we have a unfortunate history uh, in the business world of calling certain styles that are associated with certain cultures like unprofessional. And I, I think that that's just like something we need to leave behind. And um, but otherwise, yeah, I prefer to be able to wear what I want to work. And I kind of pick workplaces that let me do that, especially after the pandemic, all my <laughs> Uh, clothes kind of changed during lockdown, so it would I would have to buy a whole new wardrobe if it became like a a professional wear situation. But uh, you know, um, takes all kinds of businesses to make a world, doesn't it? <laughs> Do y'all know Alpha Kappa Psi? Is that a fraternity? Yeah, it's a business fraternity. Um, I was in AKSI, and one of the things that they taught us was, it, it's a business fraternity, and it, it's, like, actually, like, very well connected to a lot of, like, top financial firms. Of course, I didn't ever get into that because I'm marketing, right? But I, I rushed AKSI, and they have a philosophy about how you um, conduct yourself in a way that um, leads to excellence. And they do, um, you know, when you pledge, you have to like show up in business attire and you have to be put together. And, and a lot of that training is really just like paying attention to details, you know? Like in the, if you can show that you pay attention to details about yourself and the way that you dress, um, it shows that you're self-aware. It shows that you like understand culture. It shows that you're capable of looking at the people around you and seeing what they're doing and emulating it, you know, f fitting into a culture, um, picking up on whatever culture you're in, that type of thing. Um, so all of those things that the fraternity would, you know, teaches its pledges before they become brothers are generally important as you establish business culture. Um, that being said, oh, and also I really think that school uniforms are good, um, especially for girls. Teenage girls probably should wear school uniforms, um, just in, in general for like the mental health of the other children in that school. Um, but yeah, I I don't put, I put zero effort into the way that I look when I'm working because, you know, our company doesn't, our company is a lot more focused on what we produce. And um, in general, if I don't have to pay attention to the way I look, like, I don't. I believe, like, you know, everyone should know what is appropriate and what's not appropriate when it comes to, like, office attire. Um, but at the same time, I do believe, like, the way you dress is also like a another self a form of 
self-expression in a way. Um, and going back to the point where it's like, you know, we are in a, we're in marketing, and so we're not really entirely a customer facing role. Um, I like to have like that option to be casual or business casual and comfortable while I do my work. Um, and I do think dress codes in general, you know, there is like some utilitarian like emphasis behind it and like, it does like impact, you know, some people negatively, like what Melanie was saying earlier about what is someone's culture is con considered inappropriate in like office culture or office attire, sorry. And sometimes that's like not the, the case usually. Um, so I think that, you know, offices should imply like maybe not so much of a dress code really, because we're here to work. Um, do our work, uh, but it also depends on which department you're in. Yeah, great point for sure. Um, yeah, I lean away from mandatory things um, for dress code uh, for a lot of the reasons that have just been said, but um, and especially now that, you know, often in a company, right, everyone's an adult, right? Like you should know what's appropriate and what's not. I think the most important part about you know the way in which dress codes do function well is creating a sense of team um and i think that like any time that you're looking at creating like a uniform or a set of like guidelines it should be for the purpose of like fostering a sense of togetherness um, and to do that effectively i think you probably want it to not be mandatory but make it appealing enough so that people want to be a part of it and they want to do it um, which means like again if you're creating branded apparel it means making it fun and cool so that people want to wear it they want to say yeah i'm part of this team um, and you think about like especially in europe um but also in america as well like every, people are rabid sports fans right and they're not even a part of the philadelphia eagles organization or shout out dennis the new york giants organization but they might wear a New York Giants shirt, right? And now we're part of a company, right? Like we're part of this team. Like, yes, we should probably want to wear at least something, right? Especially if you're talking to somebody who's you're on a visit out to some T-Mobile office or something, right? You should probably want to be like, yeah, I'm a part of this team. I'm going to like, and that's on us to create um, as the marketing team for sure. But also it's on like everyone is like, this is something that we want to be a part of. And I don't think you get there by mandating it. I think some people might argue that you can get there by mandating it. Um, you can kind of like shortcut it, but that does if you mandate it and it's not something that's appealing, then eventually people will rebel against it. They might like comply if you put like penalties against it or something, but eventually, you know, it won't work and people will figure out ways to subvert it. And the moment you have somebody and people in general looking to subvert it because it's mandatory and they don't like it, I think that's when you really start running into like cultural issues for sure. So back to Jane Marie's point a little bit, like I think one of the best, like understanding the quote unquote rules about like any sort of like attire or what's, and then understanding how to do break them in a way that like works, I think is like a really, really valuable skill, especially in like creative fields for sure. Yeah, you know, and I just kind of want to point out one more thing, which is that even though I think all of us on this call, you know, have been talking about like, yeah, you know, self-expression is great. Being comfortable is great. You know, it's not entirely about the individual. And so as long as everybody understands that, like, I think that there is kind of a sense that you want to be like respectful of others. So, you know, you want to be clean and you don't want to be distracting. But like, how do you codify that? It just seems like it's an issue when you try to codify that. But I and, and I think that's why we're kind of like, you know, we're all adults here. Um, but but it doesn't mean that we're like saying that there should be a free for all. It's just right. it's kind of hard to codify what is distracting and, uh, you know, and, and then some some of it is just so common sense, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's almost better to like set. Um is basically to like set like, hey, we're representing the brand or like we're representing this and here's how we represent it 
and here are the and we'll provide the tools you know whether it's like a hey well, we prefer you know this kind of look if you're out or hey we want you to wear branded apparel so here it is right yeah um then you give something for people to aspire to versus like a baseline for them to meet and i think that generally works better as a rule if you give somebody if you're clear about what people should be aspiring to and you give them the tools to get there i think people generally respond to that uh, so the last one is we'll play Would You Rather. Um, so let's get some quick reactions. And again, nothing unhinged, but it should be a should be a pretty interesting activity. So the first one is um, espresso machine in the office or cute cafe five minute walk away. Cute cafe five minute walk away one hundred percent of the time. And I'll fight y'all if you all say something else. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, I'm I'm espresso machine in in the office. That's insane. <laughs> I, I don't want to have to go anywhere. Okay, because it's free. <laughs> I understand because it's, it's free. free. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I I get that. But like, if you can choose between having an espresso from a machine or having a like a latte that's made with milk and love. Like I, that's like asking someone, "Hey, would you prefer to eat a croissant or a d d donut from the gas station?" Like it's not. <laughs> I don't need love in my coffee, in my my black coffee. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I just need bean juice. Form <laughs> <Function>. over function. <laughs> Erica, also, what do you think? Sorry. Uh, you know, those are very solid points. Like, I am a sucker for coffee shops. Like, I would drive 30 minutes max for a cute coffee shop. Um, but in terms of convenience and not wanting to leave, like, a place that I've already arrived at, you know, I can never say no to free coffee. So. <laughs> free coffee or a $6 latte in this economy. <laughs> I am going to go with Jane Marie here. I want the cute coffee shop. And the reason I want it is because let's say I'm working, let's say like Erica, Jane Marie, and I, and Melanie, let's say we're all, let's be inclusive. We're all working on a project together and we're going insane. Let's walk to a coffee shop and grab a latte at two in the afternoon. That breakup, I think, is key. Like the, physical act of like getting into a different space, I think is a really, really valuable thing. Um, so given like an either or, I'm absolutely taking the Q coffee shop um, and I'm sort of like demanding that we have a coffee budget um, just to like offset the amount of dollars that I spend. Um, but obviously you prefer to have both. This was the beautiful, um, yeah. I've had offices where you have like a Keurig and also a Phil's coffee, which is a Bay Area thing, um, two minutes a walk, a walk away. And man, did I go to the Phil's every day. So I know which one I not only know which one I would conceptually choose, I know which one I chose in reality. <laughs> yeah, I would pick a cute coffee coffee shop over a Keurig. Yeah, that's why I had to make it like a nice espresso machine. Yeah, if it's a nice espresso machine, then I'm I'm good. I'll take it. Which, to be clear, Jane Marie, <laughs> with a nice espresso machine, you can make your own latte and you can put love into it in the office. I mean, but can you? Can you make yes. your own latte? Uh, have you ever tried to steam milk like by yourself with your own espresso machine? Was um, it successful? Yeah. To be clear, though, I was a barista for a year. <laughs> okay. So okay. I worked at a local coffee shop for a year. And okay. now my father has a very nice espresso setup that is coffee shop level. And okay. so, yes, I can do that. Okay. <laughs> so I might cool. be like a little bit of an odd choice here for that, but it is possible. And like, yeah, if we're working together, I can make it. I'm there. I'm the built in. That's true. Okay. If Sam can make my lattes, then I would prefer to do that. But if it's not, I, I will <laughs> never go to a coffee shop and order black espresso. Because that's like, I don't even know. I, I can't even think of an analogy as dark. That's like voluntarily saying, you know, I don't want to work in marketing. I want to go work in a coal mine or something. I don't know. I, 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 but.
black espresso it has um loses the the joy of coffee so uh, disagree <laughs> you're a writer you I need am. black espresso and honestly probably a cigarette like that's your whole that should be your whole life to see right there the entire aesthetic <laughs> yeah all right next would you rather is a uh, 30 minute car commute 45 minute train commute train I want to say car only because I prefer to have my own space like in my car I can like if I'm hungry just reach over for my bag for a snack or you know I don't I wouldn't have to deal with like unnecessary delays but I I guess like traffic kind of makes up for it um yeah I just feel like I love to have my own bubble <laughs> when I'm traveling <laughs> What do you guys think? Well, I'm in Atlanta. So yeah, here it's uh I risk my life every day on the road. And uh there's a little bit of drama on Marta sometimes, but uh I think overall I'm safer on Marta. And uh Yeah, that's is. true. So I, w I wish that I had that option. Um I'm just not quite on the right bus route. Because, you know, our new office does have a complimentary shuttle from from Marta, which is very cool. So, you know. That is cool. That's a great feature of our new office. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I wish my house was near Marta so that it would make sense for me to drive to Marta instead. Yeah, I will say that cheaper. it would be cheaper. That's true. Yeah, when I was in college, I saved so much money taking Marta to the airport instead of Ubers. Like, it was the difference between paying $2 and $50 every time. Um, but Emery's not connected to Marta, so that's, you had to take an Uber to the thing, like, three miles away, whatever. Um, yeah, I would probably go train, like Melanie, just because then I'm not personally responsible. The thing that scares me about driving is not that I will get in an accident. It is that I will be distracted and then I will cause someone else to be in an accident, right? Like yeah. that that amount of responsibility is really like quite terrifying to me and my like, uh, my sense of like, I don't know, like responsibility for my fellow humans. And I, I really do prefer just sitting on a train. I can be on my phone. Yeah, so... I struggle with this question, which is why I wanted to ask you guys. So here's my key problem with this question is that 15 minutes each way is 30 minutes a day. Five days a week is two and a half hours a week times 50 weeks a year is 125 hours a year, which is a significant amount of time, right? Like that's probably like four or five days that you're spending extra commuting. So for me, it's car. Unless now the difference between a train though is that if you're on the train, like Jane Marie says, you don't have to like be you're not driving the train. So you can kind of like do whatever you want. So if that train ride, and especially if there's no stops, right? If it's just like I walk a minute and then I grab on a train and then I have 40 minutes on the train and then I walk five minutes to my office. Now we're talking of like, okay, that's 40 minutes where I can just kind of like park myself in a seat and do other things. So if you can redeem that 45 minutes, then all of a sudden the train becomes way more of an efficient option. Um, and again, whatever it works for you, if like people watching is your thing, then absolutely the train, or if you know you can grab your laptop out, like trains in Europe, for instance, often have Wi-Fi. So, and you can like catch up on your emails on the train or something like that. Now we're talking. So it kind of depends on what the actual like situation with the train is, I feel like, for to justify that 125 hours that you're quote unquote losing in your commute. Well, if you can not lose it by taking the train, then that's my answer. All right, last would you rather, um, and this is a would you rather question I came up with at the beginning of this call and we were talking about daylight savings time. Would you rather get into the office before the sun comes up or leave the office after the sun goes down? Yeah, for me, it's going to be the first one, you know, let's let's have that that daylight in the morning uh i'm willing to trade off that a little bit of a darkness at night yeah i 
prefer to have a lot of sunlight um, right when I leave the office. I I find it hard, especially during the fall time when it's dark when I go in the office and dark when I leave the office. So, you know, having to invest in a sad lamp or happy lamp or, uh, you know, I need that. I need sunlight in order for me to function well. So I wouldn't mind like um, getting rid of daylight savings and just having my sunsets at 8 p.m. Because then I'll feel more productive with my day. You know, when the sun goes down, I wouldn't really want to do much. It'll make me feel more in my cocoon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I agree with Erica. I like walking. I I used to say that I would get up in the morning and walk my dogs, and that happens absolutely never. I always walk my dogs after work, and it's nice when it's light out. So, I think this is an anti-daylight savings podcast now. <laughs> I think we're all anti-daylight savings. Um, I would probably go with prefer that the sun is up when I leave, because then, right, like your day is done, but you still feel like you can do things with it, I think. And I think that's really mentally important for me. Um, I also, I have a happy lamp, sled lamp. Um, I, again, Erica and I, California kids, we need sun all the time. Um, however, I've been reading a lot of research that it's super important to get sunlight before looking at your phone or your computer for your circadian rhythms. Um, and so now I'm kind of torn, right? Obviously, I prefer both, but um if it really is that valuable to get up and like go for a walk and face the sun um in the morning for your like body's circadian rhythms to function more properly then that might be something valuable to think about too cool great episode everyone this has been a another episode of b to t if you liked it you can subscribe to us on youtube you can listen to us on spotify or apple podcasts or check out mobius.ai to learn more. Thanks everyone.